Welcome back. In this lecture, we will introduce you to the random forest model. Now, by the end of this lecture, you should be able to describe how the random forest model can make inferences and also understand the role of confidence scores uh, and how they're used in a classification result. So in an earlier lecture, we studied a decision tree. And at each node of the decision tree, a feature, an associated threshold for a value of that feature is examined. And then the, de the decision tree then transitions to a different node, depending on the value of the previous feature. And it does this iteratively till it reaches a final conclusion. Now, we had talked about one of the main problems with the decision tree was it had some performance issues in terms of things like accuracy and precision. And that's unfortunate because there's some very nice positives about the decision tree. It's very simple. It's easy to implement. It gives you an explanation. So it can tell you why it made a given classification decision. It's also very performant. And it can be trained with a relatively small amount of data. So what we're going to talk about today is how we use an ensemble of learners to get better performance. So while an individual decision tree doesn't give us the best uh, performance in terms of accuracy, there is a theory that if you have a lot of uh, learning models that maybe individually do not perform well, and then you combine the results in what's called an ensemble, you could do a lot better. And perhaps one of the most popular methods of ensemble learning today is the random forest. And when we use the word forest, we're talking about a forest of decision trees. And here is an example random forest visualized that I trained using the iris flower data set that we've been discussing throughout this course. So here's how it works. Once I've trained all these decision trees, and now we see a new sample. So in this case, we have new measurements of an iris flower. Each decision tree processes that on its own. Now, for those of you who know a bit about things like GPUs and multi-core and parallel computation, you can easily see that in an inference step, this is totally trivial to parallelize. So anyway, given our new flower, each of these decision trees reaches a conclusion. Now, these decision trees are all trained on different subsets of the data. So that's why they look different. And notice each, you know, they each has come to a conclusion, and not all the time has the conclusion been the same. This is OK, because then the next step we look at is how to aggregate the scores of the different decision trees. And a very simple way to do that that's widely used is through voting. And so we have three classes, 0, 1, and 2. None of the decision trees classified our new sample as class 0. Seven of them classified it for class 1. And then three classified it for class number 2. Now what you can do is you can interpret votes as what's called a confidence score. And this is very easy to do. In this case, we will just normalize a score. So now we have a level of confidence. So this is like saying that, hey, you know, um, it's very likely that it thinks it's class one, but there's a little bit of a chance it could be in class two. Now, one thing to be careful of with confidence scores is they may look like a probability. But note, they are not a probability. There's nothing. Uh, inherently probabilistic about this particular approach. And so we should not assume that, you know, this adheres to the probability axioms and so forth. Now, sometimes in a larger model, people may make an assumption that they say, hey, we're going to assume that the model gave us a probability distribution over classes. You know, that may or may not be OK, given the application. But just note that this is not a probability. It's a confidence, which is why we use that term. 
So throughout this course, we will talk a little bit about how the training process works for each of these models. And again, why this is important is because if you have a little bit of intuition as to how the training process works, you will kind of uh, have a better idea of you know, where this model will work well. You will also have a good notion of what the hyperparameters mean. And speaking of hyperparameters, that's what we will talk about next. So hyperparameters, for, uh, just to refresh everyone's memory, these are just numeric values associated with the model structure or with the learning algorithm. They are not assigned by the training process. So when we think of, say, another type of model, whether it's you know, the slope assigned to a, a given uh, feature in a linear regression model, or if it's a threshold value in a standard decision tree, those come from the training process. We're not talking about that with hyperparameters. We're talking about things that we use to tune the model that affect how that process works. So if you recall back to our discussion of decision trees, uh, a very common hyperparameter was the maximum depth of the decision tree. So these are the key hyperparameters for a random forest. So first is the number of estimators, and this is simply the number of decision trees in the forest. And on this slide, I am showing you nine trees. The next is the maximum depth. Now, with a single decision tree, that's the depth of that single tree. Now, the maximum depth in a random forest is the maximum depth of the, of the tree that is deepest. And in this case, it's uh, the fourth tree, as you see, and it has a depth of seven. The next is the number of samples per estimator. Now, what's interesting here is these, um, each tree is taking a subsample of the training data. It's not using all of it. And this is one of the ways that gives us diversity in the trees. And in fact, it is not even going to be the case that all the trees are going to be using the same amount of data. As you can see here, these are the uh, root node for a couple of the different trees, and all of them are starting with a different amount of samples. And this is okay, and we would expect this because we want some level of diversity in the trees. The reason why it's okay to take a random sample out of the historical data is because we are making the assumption that all of that data is generated from the same distribution. And so that is why we think um, it's safe to take a uh, subsample of the, of the uh, training data. The next is the features per split. So in addition to using different samples of data, we also limit the number of features that are considered when we make a split at each node in the decision tree. So earlier, when we went and discussed a regular decision tree, we would take a look at every uh, threshold value for every possible feature. Now here, we're only going to look at a subset of the features when making this split. And this also adds a level of diversity to the trees. And what you see here in the screen capture, this is just from the documentation from Scikit-Learn showing the uh, parameters or the, um, the hyperparameter for the maximum number of features per split and different ways it can be set. Um, but this is a very common hyperparameter in pretty much any implementation of a decision tree. So when we put this all together, how does this work? Well, for each of the number of decision trees we're going to create, uh, we're going to do the following. We're going to simply take a subsample of the historical data, or the training data rather, and then we are going to learn a decision tree using the maximum depth parameter, but we're going to only consider the specified number of features per split, and those features will be selected randomly at each decision node in the decision tree. 
And this is all there is to it. Everything else about learning a random forest is what we've already uh, discussed in training an individual decision tree. So thank you for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed the lecture.